Uh, the 2024 AFRIEXIM Trade Finance Seminar is taking place in Windhoek, Namibia. It aims to equip African financial institutions, bankers, professionals from regulatory agencies, corporates and legal firms with the skills necessary for dealing with the challenges of financing transactions under heightened global economic uh, uncertainty. Uh, one of the speakers uh, at the uh, seminar this uh, year is Laurent uh, Ruskas, who is the Executive Director for Gas Industry at EMEA with S&P Global. Good morning to you, Laurent. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. So um, you talked about uh, Africa's uh, emerging role uh, in global energy finance. Now, considering that commodity dependent nations um, like in Namibia, like in Nigeria, are subject to boom and bust cycles, how do you think they can fit in with uh, the, uh, the, the whole scheme of energy finance? Uh, thanks for having me. Great to be here. Um, of course, you're right. If you are exporting commodities, whether it's oil, gas, or, or metals or minerals, um, those are all commodities that trade globally. Uh, prices do go up and down. And so there's some boom and bust is, is unavoidable. The way to handle that, I think, is through careful management of public finances during the booms, pay down public debt. Um, but I think for, from an energy finance perspective, uh, the next phase is to move uh, building more renewables, improving the electricity grids uh, in Namibia and other countries in Africa. And that will not be susceptible to boom and bust. Now, you've worked for you know, more than two decades advising international oil and gas companies and institutional investors on energy investment in Eurasia. Uh, what's the investment case uh, for, for Africa, for that sector? Well, it, in oil and gas, the investment case always starts with having a lot of oil and gas. And so obviously there's many African nations have tremendous resources. Namibia may become one of them, uh, starting to become one of them very soon. Um, in general, the investment case, you know, there's growth in Africa. Uh, I, I think that businesses that come to work here find that there's a growing middle class of educated people who can you can staff up easily and, and have really good people working for you. And then, of course, you get higher returns. I mean, Africa does perceive to have higher risk. And with higher risk, if you can manage that and mitigate that, uh, you're going to get higher returns with that. So that, unfortunately, raises the cost of capital a little bit for African businesses, African investments, but uh, it does help attract investors to Africa. Now, when you throw uh, renewable energy into the mix, well, I guess, you know, what does the investment case look like? And in particular for fossil fuel dependent African nations, how do they, uh, you know, walk that fine line? Well, the f you've, you've got to do both. I mean, if you are uh, an oil and or gas exporter in Africa, um, keep doing that. That's fine, uh, but you should also be transforming your domestic uh, economy and your domestic energy system. And renewables these days are not about climate change or rich countries uh, wagging their, their finger at African countries saying you've got to cut your emissions, even though we're the ones that put all the CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, solar panels and battery storage associated with that, the costs have come way down. This is the cheapest way to produce energy, and that's going to be eventually delivering cheap energy to populations. Uh, of, of course, you need to build out the electricity grid and electricity distribution transmission grid along with that. That is complicated, and that's more expensive. Now, speaking of expensive, I mean, you're, you're a gas specialist. Namibia is known for mineral resources, but has shown potential for oil and gas. Nigeria is a gas giant, but hasn't quite realized its potential. Is the capital intensive nature of gas exploration a hindrance? And if yes, how do African nations get past that? Well, I mean, Namibia is in a really uh, good position right now just because of the enormous success with some of the offshore drilling that's discovered potentially vast giant oil and, and gas fields. You know, the era of developing oil and gas, it, it's not gonna last forever um, because, you know, you can debate about when the world will see peak oil demand. We, we have it at about 2030 in our base case. Um, but Namibia, if it's looks, if it's as big as it looks, uh, this is gonna be low cost oil and gas production and companies will come in. Now, in terms of financing it, of course, it's capital intensive, requires, gonna require tens of billions of dollars, but, uh, that is why you have partners from the international oil and gas industry. So I know that uh, a bunch of the leading companies, Shell, Total, ENI, BP, um, are here. 
And this is their business and financing these types of developments are their business as well. So for Namibia as the host government, you you reach uh, terms, you have fiscal terms with them, but they pay for it and then it, you get some of the revenue. Now, um, Nigeria is moving forward with compressed natural gas uh, vehicles. I mean, I know other nations in other parts of the world are pursuing electric vehicles. Um, do you see a space where CNG and EVs can, can live in harmony? Well, sure. I mean, see, if you look globally at uh, CNG vehicles versus electric vehicles, you know, EVs are winning and EVs are going to win for sure. Um, but for different countries, you know, the situation can be different. In Nigeria, where you have natural gas uh, domestically, and you can use that cheaply uh, to, to replace gasoline, which is more expensive uh, in your uh, fleet of cars, you know, that does, that does make sense and that can make sense. And I'm sure there's other countries in Africa, there's a lot of sort of gas that's that's not being developed or doesn't have anywhere to go uh, in West Africa and East Africa. And so CNG may make sense for, for those countries. But the big picture, the longer term, you know, it's pretty clear that EVs are going to win, uh, driven by Chinese manufacturers. Um, the costs are coming down. The quality is coming up. And in the long run, we'll all be driving EVs in, in all parts of, of the world. Uh, the key, of course, uh, if you're an African country that doesn't necessarily have reliable electricity supply, uh, doesn't have the infrastructure, then you've got to, alongside a gradual shift toward EVs, you know, you've got to build out that infrastructure and you've got to add, as I said, cheap solar uh, and other renewable power to, to the grid. Uh, Lauren, you got to forgive me. Uh, you do know we had some big news uh, in the U.S. with the outcome of the uh, election. It's not quite declared, but I just want to, you know, not to leave you out of politics. Is it possible that the path that the U.S. and other Western nations, well, I'll keep it with the U.S., the path that the U.S. is taking to electric vehicles, does that change with leadership? Uh, because, you know, um, former President Trump is more in tune with fossil fuels and he hasn't quite likened himself to EVs. I, my just general question just political leadership impacts the path, renewable energy path of a country, using the U.S. as an example. Well, I think you've correctly identified me as American. So uh, <laughs> I, I woke up to news that I didn't find very, uh, very positive, frankly, from my, my native land. But um, so Donald Trump's obviously has criticized very severely the big clean tech uh, uh, bill passed by the Biden administration in 2022. It's called the Inflation Reduction Act. It's really just about supporting and subsidizing clean energy. So he's a criticized this terribly and includes subsidies and, and support for EVs. Um, I think our assumption, we have teams of people looking at this, is that whatever he said, he's going to be probably a bit slower to cancel or withdraw uh, some of these subsidies. A lot of these subsidies are helping people get jobs, in, especially in red states like Texas, which is kind of the biggest boom state for, for clean energy, even though it votes Republican. The other thing, of course, there's a billionaire. His name is Elon Musk. Uh, he's from South Africa originally. And he strangely became you know, a very close uh, ally to Trump in the latter stages of the campaign, gave a lot of money, mobilized people, used formerly called Twitter, now X, to, to build up support for, for Trump. So Elon Musk is in his ear, and you can already hear Trump's comments about EVs changing as a result. So I think um, maybe the, the, there won't be as much subsidies in the early stages, but I think uh, Trump coming in being very hostile to EVs is going to be softened just simply because Elon Musk is, is, uh, is so close to him. Thank you so much for chiming in on that uh, breaking news there. Um, just back, finally, you know, back to the African continent. Ultimately, uh, how do these uh, nations, you know, uh, plug in to a, main, a pipeline of long-term financing for the oil and gas, for their respective oil and gas sectors? Well, for oil and gas, you know, I think first thing is there's a broader, there's a longer runway and more investment interest in gas right now than in oil. Obviously, if a country like Namibia discovers massive oil fields, those can get developed. But uh, if you focus on gas, you know, LNG uh, can bring that gas anywhere in the world, liquefying it and putting it in, in, in tankers. So, you know, focus on LNG, focus on partnerships. You've got to have partnerships, you know, that, uh, uh, not only a country like Namibia, but no country in Africa uh, is really in a position to do this alone. So build partnerships with 
the big international energy companies uh, try to make those partnerships work. And that, of course, means a stable uh, investment climate. Uh, don't don't change the rules every few years. You see countries in other parts of the world that do that, and it it, it slows down investment. So put that stability into place, build strong partnerships, and then you know we think there's quite even with climate change and the energy transition, there's still a lot of people around the world going to be using oil and gas for for the next couple of decades. All right, Lauren Uskas, uh, Senior uh, Energy Director over with gas at EMEA for S&P Global. Thank you so much for speaking to us. We appreciate your time.